Thank you, Ken and choir. My heart was surely moved and blessed as we were witnessing not only families coming, but these children coming and bringing a sacrificial offering to the Lord uh, for the purchase of the property. It's just an exciting time and exciting occasion for them to be involved and to share with us. Uh, We're going to be sharing with you the total at the very end of the service, both for our 8 o'clock service as well as for this service, so that we can rejoice and Praise God for what He's done among us. I know that you'll want to just continue to pray. Several years ago, while Tracy and I were pastoring in Florida, we would make a trip up I-75 from the Tampa area all the way up to the Atlanta area in Georgia. We would stop shy of the Atlanta area because Tracy's grandmother at that time lived in Jeffersonville, which was a small city just outside of Atlanta. And so we would go to visit her. We had left our uh, kids here and we, most everybody else that we knew when we journeyed into Florida to do mission work for a few years, we, we would travel back and forth to see her grandmother. And there were occasions that we would leave after a service on Sunday evening and drive up to the Atlanta area. Well, it was about a seven hour drive for us to get from uh, where we were down on the peninsula all the way up to that area and so as we would travel I enjoyed traveling at night there was less traffic especially uh, on I-75 but I would always turn on the radio and I would listen to an AM station and I would pick up several different AM stations some of it talk radio but one in particular was a Christian radio broadcast company and they would have a broadcast of the Pacific Garden Mission out of Chicago, Illinois. It was a powerful station out of Chicago that would actually broadcast this particular uh, ministry. And it actually had to do with first-person dramatizations of individuals who had actually been a part of this Pacific Garden mission at this time. And uh, it was always amazing to me to listen to the stories because they dealt with inner-city work. They dealt with people who had uh, come from broken lives. Those were on drugs, alcoholics. And there were some tremendous God stories that would be shared kind of in the first person. They would talk about it and, and would kind of walk through the experience while they were on the radio. It always fascinated me and I followed up to exactly find out about the Pacific Garden Mission of Chicago. It actually was started in the 1880s, and it was started by a couple by the name of George and Sarah Clark. They actually rented a notorious saloon called the Pacific Beer Garden. Now, when they leased it, they took the name Beer, and they added the word Mission, and then they launched that ministry to the down down and trodden men and women of the inner city of Chicago. In the early years, Colonel and Mrs. Clark bore the cost and the expenses of running that mission out of their own pockets. But as the mission continued to grow, it wasn't long until they were out of money and eventually they could not even pay the rent. They didn't have enough money in their own personal account to pay the rent. And so they were given 24 hours to come up with enough money to pay the rent for the next month. And so... Colonel and Mrs. Clark, on their knees, prayed through the night that God would some way miraculously provide the money for the ongoing work of that mission. They reminded God that they were ministering to people who otherwise would not be touched or maybe not impacted in quite the way that this mission could impact their lives. And so as they prayed through the night, they came to the next morning and Their yard was blanketed in white. They walked outside to get a closer look and they discovered that a rare mushroom had, mushrooms had grown of the highest quality, had grown all over their yard. And it wasn't even mushroom season. Amazingly, they gathered the crop and Charles carted the mushrooms down to the Palmer house and they sold them to the chefs for enough money to pay the rent for the next month. Years later, they called Claire Mom Clark. Mother Clark commented on the experience and she said it this way. 
No mushrooms were ever seen there before, nor any since. The only way that they could explain it is that God provided the need that they had for that occasion. God is in the business of doing the miraculous. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above any of us could ever ask or could ever think. Israel learned this lesson throughout her history time and time again as God dealt with the nation of Israel. This morning, I want you to consider with me Jeremiah chapter 29. And we're going to look together in just a moment at verses 11 through verse 14 as we share this passage of Scripture. So I'd invite you to turn there with me and I'll read these verses and you follow along. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me, and I will come, and pray to me, and I will hear. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from whence I have sent you into Exile. Jeremiah has been called the weeping prophet. Most of us are very familiar with this major prophet of the Old Testament. Jeremiah actually wrote this letter about 575 B.C. And he wrote it to Judah because they had been displaced from Jerusalem. And they had been taken into bondage and into slavery into Babylon. Now, if you read the earlier verses of chapter 29, you'll discover that it was of the purpose of God for the nation of Israel that they be taken to Babylon. They certainly did not want to leave their comfort zone there in Jerusalem and be led away into Babylon, but God says to them, there's something that I want you to know. You might as well get adjusted to living in Babylon because you're going to be there 70 years. Look, if you would, very quickly down in verse 5. He tells them to build houses there and to live, to plant gardens, to marry, to get accustomed to living in Babylon because that's the place that they're going to spend the next 70 years, it's going to be a place of exile. Now, once again, Jeremiah was not simply saying to them, what I want you to do is to live in Babylon and become like this pagan nation. That was not the point that Jeremiah was writing to Judah. Rather, he was saying to them, since you're going to be in a place that is very uncomfortable for you, You're going to be displaced from what you've been used to doing. You might as well get used to that fact and you might as well settle down because I've got some things to teach you and yet my purposes are good. My purposes are for your blessing. You know, oftentimes we take this 11th verse out of chapter 29 and and we lift it and we talk about how we know that God has special plans for each of our lives. And we know that those plans are for our benefit. They're for our welfare. They're for good. They're to give us a future and a hope. And it's almost as though we ignore the context of what is actually being said by Jeremiah as he writes this letter to God's people. I think about it once again with me. They've been led from a place that they've been very comfortable enjoying. They've been associated with people around them. They know and so they feel secure and now all of a sudden they are uprooted and they are in a place that they know not even the language. They don't understand all that's going on and Jeremiah tells them, and by the way, there are, as we learn from this chapter, there are some false prophets there also. And they're saying, don't listen to Jeremiah. He hasn't got a word from God. 
He really doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, I have a lot of sympathy for Jeremiah. I said earlier, he's called the weeping prophet. And the reason he's called the weeping prophet is God gave him a message. And there's several messages here, but it's about judgment. It's calling a wicked people to repent of their sins. And if they do not, God is going to bring judgment. Now, you would think that sooner or later, God's people would learn that God's Word is true. And what God has said, you can bank on. And God is going to fulfill His Word. But Israel, just like you and I today, were a people that often forget. I mean, it's easy for us to go through one experience, and God teaches something, and then maybe a few years later to go through another experience, and we have to relearn the lesson over again that maybe God has already taught us, or that we feel like that God has taught us in this particular setting. The exile prompted them to seek God with all of their heart. Without this exile, they probably would have just settled down and and just kept on living the kind of life that they lived and ignored God and gone on, done what they wanted to do. But God had a purpose for His people. And you know, I think that's something that every one of us want to discover. We want to know that our life is counted while we've lived in this earth. We want to know that we have a purpose in existing and in living. Several years ago, Rick Warren wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. He also wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Church. And it sold millions of copies, not just to religious people, but to secular people. Secular people who wanted to find out, does my life really have meaning and a purpose? Or am I just going through the motions, doing what I always do and and, uh, being devoid of any kind of fulfillment even though my life is filled up with activities? Children of Israel were uprooted from something that they were very comfortable with and then they were placed in a new environment and in that new environment they had an experience that really challenged their very being. I want to read to you this morning what Eugene Peterson says about exile and the meaning of exile. He says, exile is being where we don't want to be with people that we don't want to be with. In other words, exile is not just moving from Jerusalem and moving into Babylon. Exile for many of us today is being moved through experiences in life that are very uncomfortable as we know it. And God uproots us out of a comfortable situation and puts us in the land of discomfort. Eugene Peterson further says, it's for us to make a decision. He says, While will I focus my attention on what is wrong with the world and feel sorry for myself? Or will I focus my energies on how I can live at my best in the place that I find myself? In other words, God moves us from the position of a comfort zone out into places that we don't feel very familiar and we're not real comfortable with. And then He challenges us, be the people of God in that place. I said a moment ago, it wasn't for Israel to become like the Babylonians. And neither is it for you and me to live like the secular world around us because God has us in a place and it may feel like a place of exile. It may be a loss of job. It could be a divorce. It could be a bankruptcy. It could be a variety of issues and circumstances. It could be a move that puts us in a position that we're not very comfortable with. And we're wondering, God, do you really, do you understand where I am? Do you understand what's going on? And God is saying, I fully understand. And I have a plan. And I have a purpose for your life 
and for your so-called exile at this particular point so that you can bring honor and glory to me you will seek my face that's exactly what was going on in this particular setting and while many of them obviously did not understand all of the new new situations around them Jeremiah's letter was a word from God that said, I have plans for you. I want you to notice this as you follow along with me in your outline. First of all, God's plan for His people is positive. How do we know that? If you look in verse 11, He says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Sometimes in these transitional days in our lives, we begin to see things in a negative light in such a way that we almost want to blame God for where we are in the station of life. The circumstances around us, what has happened, and all of a sudden, rather than really seeing God's plan and God's purposes, we almost feel like that God is not aware of what's going on in that setting, that He even knows what's going on. And yet the children of Israel learned to be the people of God in a foreign land. It shook their comfort zone in the same way that you and I are shaken by the circumstances of life today. And you know, it's a situation where many of us, we finally learn one of these days we're not just going to simply settle down in this life and get so comfortable that we're not shaken at one time or another. As one man says, we're either going into a storm, we're in the middle of a storm, or we're coming out of a storm. Sometimes that's a pretty good description of everyday life and everyday experience. And yet all too often we have this imagination that as Christians, you know, God's got this plan for us that we're just going to have such a wonderful life and there's going to be no trial. I'm not going to be uprooted one day and find myself in a position among a people that I really didn't want to be at. And that's when God says, will you be my person in Babylon? Will you be a witness? Because this is a positive thing for your life. Throughout years of ministry, I've been able to witness, not only in my own life, but in the lives of others. People who look at those circumstances of life around them, and sometimes they turn away from God, and they turn away from the church, and they blame God with their circumstances, and they sour in life. And they refuse to let the hardship and the difficulty of life help them grow closer to the Lord and help them grow stronger in their relationship with Him. And then there are others who may not have all of the easy answers to every circumstance in life, but you know what they do? They've learned to believe that God has a plan. They've learned to believe that God has a purpose even in the difficult situations of life that I can be drawn closer to Him, that He can do something extraordinary in my life if I'm only willing to allow Him to work in my heart and in my life. Will you be the person that God has planted wherever in the uncomfortable circumstances of life to be used for His honor and for His glory. But I want you to notice, secondly, God's plan for His people is futuristic. If you'll notice there also in verse 11, He says to them, you have a future and you have a hope. Sometimes that's all that's needed to help us go forward is just simply to understand that God does have a future for our lives. And it may not be exactly like we felt it would be, but we know that He has a plan and we know that He has a purpose. But if God has a futuristic plan for our lives, He's doing something in the immediate, the now, that will lead us toward that day. But there are two things that have to happen in your life and my life if we're ever going to see that futuristic dream come to pass. Number one is I'm going to have to leave the past behind. Now, you know something? That's difficult for every one of us. 
And I'm not saying forget all that's happened in your life. I'm a firm believer that there ought to be some stones of remembrance in every one of our lives. There ought to be some days that we've walked with God that we can point back and say, it was only by His grace that I was able to live or to go forward. It was by God's grace that He provided for my need. Those are stones of remembrance from the past. But it's not as though I choose to live my life in the past. Some of us have never let go of those things that we want to hold on to that may be dear to us. They may have been a, a blessing. They may have been a benediction in our lives. But the Bible says that the mercies of the Lord are fresh and new every day. I don't have to borrow from yesterday. I can glory in the fact that God was in my life in that day and that He blessed me in that day. But I don't have to live in the past. I've got to be willing to let go of the past. You see, for the children of Israel, they were in a new land. They were in a land where they couldn't even speak the language. And they were all saying, oh, wasn't it good in Jerusalem? In our minds, let's just go back there. But God was saying to them, why don't you settle down here and why don't you be my people in a land that I've taken you to that you're going to be in for 70 years? years there may be some things in your life today that you've got to let go of if you're going to advance in your spiritual growth with the Lord some things that were a blessing and a benediction but you're trying to substitute that for the future plan that God has for your individual life the second thing is I must receive God's plan for my life by grace that's how it comes to you and to me because we certainly are not deserving of God's blessing and God's plan for our life. It was only by God's grace that He continued to deal with Israel in their sinfulness. He patiently dealt with their lives and drew them unto Himself. But it was by God's grace and it is by God's grace today that I've got to be willing to open my life and say, Lord, I need your grace and your strength. You carry me through the circumstance that I'm in. You give me the strength and the power to be all that you want me to be. A number of years ago, Pastor John Bassanio pastored the First Baptist Church of Houston. He was sharing in one of the messages that he preached about his young daughter, who at that time was five years old, Marjorie Jan. And she came to him one day while he was in his study reading a book. And she said to him, Daddy, would you build me a dollhouse? And of course, he turned from the book and he said, well, Honey, yes, I'll build you a dollhouse. I'll certainly build you a dollhouse. And then he went back to his book reading it. She went out of his office. All of a sudden, as he looked out the window of his office, he could see her taking dolls out and piling them up in the yard. It wasn't long before he saw some doll dishes going out to the yard. It wasn't too many minutes later that he saw this big old pile out in the yard. And so he asked his wife, he said, What in the world is Marjorie Jan doing? And she said, She's preparing for that dollhouse you promised to build her. He threw his book aside. He went quickly down to the lumber yard and bought some lumber, backed it up to the backyard, and got busy building the dollhouse. Marjorie Jan took Daddy at his word and began to live it out. God's Word is powerful to you and to me in our individual life, but it's only as we begin to act on it by grace. We begin to move forward. You see, in a very human sense, that child's action motivated an earthly father. I wonder what God thinks about you and me and our individual lives when we take Him at His Word and we begin to act, we begin to live, we begin to move and follow the will and the plan of God. God said through Jeremiah, I not only have a plan for you, it's a future and it's a hope. You're going to be able to bank on that hope. Not very comforting words probably to those that had just been exiled to Babylon. Babylon. 
but there was the hope of the future. Notice thirdly in your outline, God's plan for His people is redemptive. Look, if you would, at verse 12. He says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Sometimes in our own individual lives, the only time we're in a posture to seek the Lord with our, all of our hearts is when we are completely helpless. When we're not able to maneuver and manipulate the circumstances and situations and we are simply at that place, God says it is a redemptive plan for your life. In other words, one of these days I'm going to restore you to the land of Jerusalem. I'm going to bring you back to Israel. But for now you're going to be in a land of exile. I can remember when the Iron Curtain was first taken down. And I remember reading an article about the number of Russian Jews that began to pour into the land of Israel. Tracy and I were in the land of Israel several years ago with a group from our church and we were talking with a lady that we had met at a cafe. And she had told us that she came to Israel because she felt that God was calling her as a Jew back to Israel. And she could not escape that. And she left her homeland and she had made her way back to Israel. The prophecy of this book was not only fulfilled in this day, but the prophecy of God is going to be fulfilled as Jews from across the country, across the world begin to flood their way back in to Jerusalem. It is the land that God has promised to Israel. Jeremiah said a redemptive word because it was God who was speaking that redemptive word. He said, I'm going to forgive your sins because you're going to seek me with all of your heart. You're going to seek me with all of your heart. And that's really what God wants to bring about in your life and my life many times through the circumstances. I watched these children just a moment ago and the excitement of being able to bring an offering. We've heard the testimonies of some of them sacrificing things so that they could share in an offering like this. Surely they don't understand all of the implications of what that means. But I want to tell you something. One of these days, if the Lord tarries, some of these very children are going to be in this community. They're going to look back on a day when the people of God had faith. To believe God and to share with the resources that God had blessed them so that we could advance the cause of Christ in this community and beyond. See, God works in mysterious ways. God works His wonders to perform in the lives of individuals, but He works in a redemptive way. Then finally, I want you to notice God's plan is limitless. Once again, verse 14, he says, I'm going to bring you back. That seemed like an impossibility to the people of God, but God was going to bring them back because it was God's desire to bring honor and glory to His name. His plan is limitless. If you and I could just begin to dream, not our dream, but God's dream. How He would have us interact in the community that we're living in. How He would have us be the people of God in this community to be His witness for His honor and for His glory. Robert Morgan in one of his books tells the story about sitting up one night worrying about a circumstance and a situation in his life. He couldn't sleep so he got out of bed he turned on a light, he had a chair next to a light and a nightstand, and he began to read the Bible. Just so happens that as he read the Bible, he came across an underlined verse, which was Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. In the New International Version, it says four words, Leave room for God. Leave room for God. Now, the context of that entire verse has to do with not being vengeful. And God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. 
Robert Morgan didn't have anything in his heart against anybody. It wasn't a matter of him being angry and being vengeful against anybody. But those four words penetrated his heart. Leave room for God. And he began to think about it. The circumstance that he was in that he was so worried about. Spent most of the night up, sleepless, worrying, trying to do what he could do. And then these four words, leave room for God. You know, it might be with a financial situation that you're in right now. Leave room for God. It could be with a job opportunity or a job situation where you just simply need to leave room for God. Jeremiah's word was to a people who were in bondage, to a people who were uncomfortable, who were trying to do everything they could to resituate themselves. And yet the word comes, leave room for God. God can do the impossible. You and I will run to the end of our resources. Leave room for God. I want you to bow with me in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you that your word is a rock. We thank you, Lord, that your word can cut to the innermost of our hearts and our lives. We thank you that your spirit uses the word to give us guidance and direction. And I pray today, Lord, for many of us who may feel in a very uncomfortable situation. It may be by our own doing. It may be simply because you've allowed circumstances to draw us unto yourself. I pray today, Lord Jesus, that we would not try to go it alone. But I pray even as these words are spoken that we would leave room for God. We would allow you to enter the circumstances of life to draw us unto yourself to transform us to be the people that you've called us to be. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.